Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the crucified, risen, ascended, and reigning Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God's Word speaks to us today from St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 28, where St. Paul writes, and we know that for those who love God, all things, all things work together for good for those who who are called according to his purpose. The question that I want us to ponder this morning is, do all things work, really work together for good, as St. Paul writes? For instance, a seemingly healthy 12-year-old girl develops a severe migraine headache. On Friday evening, she's taken to the hospital. Twelve hours later, she is dead. Her father called her the sunshine of my life. A young boy goes with his church's youth group on an outing. That night, he comes down with a fever. The next morning, he, is, he has trouble breathing, and his mother calls the doctor. By the time the ambulance arrives, he has stopped breathing. The doctor does everything he can, but the boy dies from a bacterial infection. A man feels the call of the Lord to go into the seminary. He leaves his good job and moves to a distant city to enter the seminary. His wife takes a job to help him make it through it. He's in his last year of study, and in just a few months, he'll receive his first call to serve the Lord. But one day, his wife comes home from work and says, I'm leaving you. I don't want to be a pastor's wife. She walks out and never comes back. That last story happened to a former classmate of mine. So do all things work together for good? Can we still believe Romans 8.28, where Paul writes, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, many of us are not as certain as Paul was. I mean, we hope all things work together for good. We believe they do. But do we really know that to be true? Paul says, again, all things work together for good. All things. That's the key. But if Paul was here today, I'd ask him, does that include sickness, suffering, divorce, suicide, or even the death of a child? And so can we still believe Romans 8.28 that all things work together for good or... Should we limit it to some things? Well, to help answer that question, there are three perspectives, three views, vantage points, that we need to keep in mind as we unpack this verse. The first perspective in understanding this verse is that we must start with God. We must start with God. You see, what happens to you and me is not luck or chance or blind fate, but rather God is actively at work in your life. God was with you before the tragedy occurred, and he was there while it happened, and he's still there with you after it's all over. God is actively at work in your life. And so the next question this leads us to, is Paul then saying that whatever happens is good? Well, the answer to that is no. Is he saying that suffering and evil and tragedy are all good? No. Is he saying that we will understand why God allowed such tragedy to happen? No. Well, then what exactly is Paul saying? 
Well, it's as though Paul is erecting a huge sign over all the unexplainable mysteries, a sign that reads, quiet, God at work. Quiet, God at work. But how? How is he at work? Well, we're not always sure. But what is the purpose? To what end is God at work in our lives, in my life? Well, it's for your good and for his glory. That's what Romans 8.28 is saying. God is at work in your life for your good and for his glory. Now, as all parents know, Little children are often afraid of the dark. They are scared because they can't see in the darkness. And so they cry out until Daddy comes. And Daddy comes and sits on the bed, takes little uh, Noah in his arms, holds him tight, and says, Noah, don't be afraid. I'm right here with you. You see, the fear goes away when Daddy arrives. Likewise, the darkness of life frightens us until we discover that our Heavenly Father is there with us. The darkness is still dark, but our Heavenly Father is there. And that makes all the difference, as any little child will tell you. And so can we still believe Romans 8.28? Yes, but we need to start with God. Now, the second perspective we need is is that we need a long-term perspective. Many things in life appear unexplainable. Why does a tornado destroy one house and leave another next door untouched? Why does one brother excel while the other struggles all his life? Why does a tumor come back when the doctor said that she got it all? The list of questions is endless. And seen in isolation, they make no sense whatsoever. If there is a purpose behind such tragedy, you and I cannot see it. And see, most of the time we judge what we cannot see by what we can see. When tragedy strikes, if we can't see a purpose behind it, We assume there isn't one. And so we often judge things by, we often judge how things will end by how they begin. We do this more often than we think, especially at sporting events. How many of you thought the Atlanta Falcons several years ago will lose the Super Bowl after being ahead 28-3 to at halftime, I bet you there's not a single person here who, ever, who even thought that. And if our beloved St. Louis Cardinals give up seven runs in the top of the first half, I'll probably not watch the rest of the game because I think I know how it will end based on how it began, which is rather poorly. But St. Paul says that we should do the exact opposite. This is the key. We should judge the beginning by how it will end. And Paul says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. The phrase work together is a single word in the Greek, sunergeo which is the word that we get, the word, the English word, synergy. What is synergy exactly? Corporations use it all the time when they're merging. But synergy is what happens when you take, when you combine two or more elements to form something completely or brand new that neither could form on their own. For instance, think of water. Water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen molecules. Now, on their own, hydrogen and oxygen 
uh, cannot make water. Can you imagine drinking hydrogen or oxygen? But when you combine two molecules of hydrogen for every molecule of oxygen, when they are combined, they produce something extremely valuable, water. That's synergy. And that's what Paul means when he says that God causes all things to work together. Those gears, right? All those gears are moving constantly. You see, many of the things that make no sense when seen in isolation, when we try to remove one of these single gears and examine it in detail, when we, when we try to take a particular experience or circumstance or situation and we remove it from the big picture and we try to understand it and it makes no sense because it's in isolation. But what God is doing, there is, you might say, there is a divine synergy going on. Even in our darkest moments, a synergy that produces something positive, something good. And the good that is produced, that is ultimately produced, could have not happened in any other way. That's the mystery of God's work. That's why all of the glory belongs to him. Because he is the one who is at work behind all this, orchestrating it, directing it, engineering it, planning it. This is how we as followers, as believers, must look at life. I mean, there's, there's simply no other way. We must not judge the end from the beginning. But rather, we must judge the beginning from how it will end, which according to Scripture will be good for our good and for God's glory. That's God's promise. That's what we live by. Okay, the third point I want to emphasize is that we need to define what good is. Right? And that is the crux of the matter. Paul says all things work together for good. But what is the good that Paul is talking about? Well, for most of us, good means things like good health, happiness, solid relationships, long life, money. Food on the table, meaningful work, and a nice place to live, right? In other words, we think the good life means a better set of circumstances. But that's not necessarily the biblical viewpoint. And in this case, we don't have to wonder what Paul means here. Paul defines it for us in the next verse, sort of like Jesus decoded his parables. Paul's going to define the good from this verse. And he says it in verse 29, the very next verse. St. Paul writes, and I'm going to repeat verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. You see, the good of Romans 8.28 is not our comfort. It's not our wealth. It's not our health. It's not our happiness, although that is often a byproduct of it. But rather, the good of Romans 8.28 is our conformity to Christ. That is the key to understanding this passage. You see, God is currently at work in your life making you like a little Christ, a Christian, 
a little Christ. And God has predestined you, as Paul says, meaning that before you were born, before you even existed, even before going back, before he created the universe, God freely and sovereignly chose you to believe the gospel message and as a result to become like Christ. And God is actively at work in your life right now making that happen. St. Paul alludes to this in his letter to the Philippians when he writes, and I am certain of this. I am absolutely confident that he who began that good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. In other words, God always finishes what he starts. Can I hear an amen to that? And so, here is how we ought to judge what is good. Good is anything that makes you and I more like Christ. And anything that pulls you away from Christ is bad, right? Now, when Paul says that all things work together for good... He is not saying that the tragedies and heartaches of life will always produce a better set of circumstances. Oftentimes, they do not. Again, God is not committed. God has not promised to make us happy and successful, although that often is the case. I mean, look at the patriarchs. Look at Abraham. Look at Isaac. Look at Jacob. What God is committed to and what he has begun in you and what he will finish in you is that you will be like Christ Jesus on the last day. And whatever it takes to make you like Jesus is good, including suffering, especially suffering. You see, when we look back on our lives, we often realize that we have learned more during the dark times in our lives than in the times of beaming sunshine. We gain more spiritual strength and maturity from sickness than from times of health. We pray more fervently when we are fearful than when we are confident. And so everything that God allows to happen to us, the tragedies, the unexplained circumstances, even those dumb choices that we sometimes make, all of that is grist. All of that is grain for the mill of God's loving purpose. Now, I came across a poem, and it goes like this. Teacher Lawrence, I think you'll enjoy this. It sounds like something from your pen. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chattered all the way but I was none the wiser for all she had to say. Then I walked a mile with sorrow, and never a word said she. But oh, the lessons I did learn when sorrow walked with me. When it comes to Romans 8.28, we face a conundrum. And the conundrum is that our good and God's good are often not the same. In fact, they may be complete opposites. We want happiness and fulfillment and peace and long life. 
Meanwhile, God is at work in us and through us. And by everything that he allows to happen to us, he is actively transforming us into the very likeness of his son. And does that include the worst that happens to you? Yes. Does that include the things that hurt you deeply? Yes. Does that include the times that you are heartbroken or discouraged? Yes. God is always at work and there is nothing that can deter him. You see, nothing reaches us. Nothing happens to us unless God first allows it. Now, the story is told of a father whose son was killed in a terrible accident. And he went to his pastor and in great anger said, Where was God when my son died? The pastor thought for a while and then gently replied, the same place he was when his son died. You see, God knows what we are going through, for he too has been there. He watched his very own son die, die at the hands of sinners. And therefore, we can say with the Apostle Paul that we know. We know. And it's not because we see the answer, but because we know him. And he knows what it's like to lose a son. He knows, and we know him. And so can we still believe Romans 8.28? Absolutely. We must. Because it's teaching us a great truth, a biblical truth, that all things ultimately contribute to the good of those who love God. All things ultimately contribute to the good of those who love God. And yet that doesn't answer every question. But it does answer the big question. Does God know what he's doing? (laughs) Absolutely. He does. And we know him. And for us, that is enough. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.